So my name's Ethan, and I'm here to talk to you about how to be successful, I guess. Um, I can figure out that a few of you are business majors. I'm guessing everyone with a tie and no jacket is the business majors. Is that correct? How about the guys who are wearing t-shirts and no ties? I'm a business major too. You're a business major too? Are you just deciding to fail the tie part? <laughs> Not in class. This takes me back. It's been a while since I was in college. Um, I just started my master's degree program at Penn State online, so I just wrote my first paper. I was up all night uh, pulling an all-nighter, so it doesn't change. Even if you're out of school for 10 years, you still pull all-nighters to get papers done. So I am a Lancaster Countyan, even though I was born in Georgia. Grew up a little bit in Massachusetts, but I've been in Lancaster County since I was 10 years old. Grew up in the southern end, down in the Solanco area. Anyone ever been down to the southern end of Lancaster? The Solanco Fair was just going on. If you've never been to the Solanco Fair or the Buck Tractor Pole, it is a cultural experience to go down there. So definitely check that out. Um, I am also a member of a family business. So I'm involved in Etown College because I'm a member of the High Center for Family Business. So I'm one of those um, second generation business operators. So my dad started the company, Matthew C., about 25 years ago. Um, and then I took over operations in 2009 and took over the whole company in 2011. I've been running it ever since. Um, so we're members at the High Center here, which is a great, great center. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the, the company that I run, um, and then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the lessons I've learned along the way. I tend to be one of the younger people um, in business when I go to all these business groups. I hang out with the older people, which are way more fun because they know a lot more, and they've got extra money to spend on cool stuff. <laughs> so Demi Learning is an independent, family-owned, and operated publishing company in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. We've been providing innovative learning solutions for homeschoolers, parents, and small group learning environments since 1990. Here's a brief history. You can read through a little bit, but we were founded in 1990 by my father. Um, he started a K through 12 math curriculum called Matthew C. And we started out selling exclusively to home educators. So I'm one of those weird, unsocialized homeschool graduates. Um, any homeschoolers in the room? None? Sometimes there's a couple. Um, but I was a homeschool graduate, so I was one of the guinea pigs of our math program. It's K through 12, and I used it all the way through. My older brother is the genius of the family, and he helped write the books, um, and I just did them and made sure that they worked. We became a corporation in 1995. Uh, we used the distribution model to sell our materials around the US. Uh, at the time, homeschooling was very regional. This was before the, this thing called the internet came around, so we used to have regional distributors in most of the states. We updated our, kept updating our stuff. Um, we went into special education in 2010, did a whole business model transition then. Um, that was when I sort of came on board. We changed our model, went from eight employees and a distribution network to 30 employees and no distribution network. So that was a pretty big change. That's worth a whole nother couple sessions to talk about. 2011, we actually formed a board, this fun thing called a board, which was my family members, uh, and they elected me as the CEO. I then developed a full strategic plan, which I'll share a little bit of, of how we wanted to grow and take what was a solid foundation in one market and expand it to other markets with some additional products. Did that, uh, one of those products, which I'll talk about is Spelling UC. We signed an author out in Ohio who had developed this innovative spelling uh, approach to teaching spelling, and we brought her on board. And then we acquired a small ed tech company called Kindertown, which is we review apps in the iOS store for parents and tell them which ones are the good ones. Because most parents are busy. They give the app to the iPad to their kids as the new babysitter, but they don't want their brains to rot playing, watching SpongeBob SquarePants every day. So, we review all the good learning apps and tell them which ones are best. And then at 14, launched a whole sales department. Um, and then we launched our Demi Learning platform earlier this year. And we're looking for outside board members. So we're making that next sort of step in the business transition. So here's our vision. We are building lifelong learners at Demi Learning. So we develop self-support, skill-based, multi-sensory, parent-engaged education products and services for parents, teachers, 
and schools working with students in pre-K through 12. So that is the niche that we've targeted for ourselves. It's good that companies have core values, vision, mission, values. You've probably heard this in your textbooks. Well, these are our core values. So we have five. We used to have seven, but none of my employees could remember seven. So we're going through a revision process, and we're down to five. I learned this in one of my, uh, I went to a speaker, and they said, people can remember five things, but they're never going to remember seven. So we, we, we went down to five. These are our top five, faithful families, durable trust, shared success between our employees and our customers. We want simple excellence, and we want sustainable growth. If any uh, education people are in the room or you know somebody who's an educator, uh, your philosophy of education sort of informs what products you develop. So these are our sort of foundational principles for how we want to teach kids. So we want parents to be engaged in the learning process, whether the child is in school, they're homeschooled, they're cyber charter schooled. Um, parental engagement is the number one indicator of academic success for kids. So the more the parents are engaged, the more likely the kids will be successful. We want multi-sensory instruction, so we use plastic blocks, we use colored pencils, we use all these extra tools to help the kids learn stuff. We want math and spelling to be fun, applicable, and practical. And then we do what's called sequential instruction that builds from concept to concept. So we are not a grade-based math or spelling program. We're what's called a competency-based or a skill-based program, similar to what you do in high school and college. Everyone knows that you shouldn't take calculus until after you've taken pre-calculus. We just sort of accept that as, well, that makes sense. Um, well, we do the same thing when it comes to addition and subtraction and multiplication. You shouldn't do multiplication and division unless you fully understand addition and subtraction. It doesn't work well in a large classroom, but it works excellently in small group guided discovery environments. So we want guided discovery with a committed instructor, instructor and individualized instruction that's adaptable to each student's strength. So it works great in what's called tutor environments, which happens to be homeschooling, tutoring, uh, special education, any student with an individualized education plan is some of our targets. Here's our main products. We've got the math, we've got the spelling, we've got Kindertown, and Building Faith Families is one of those ones of when you're making that transition from first generation to second generation, it's always good to find something for the founder to do. Um, otherwise, they come back into your business and, and start poking. Um, so Building Faith Families is what the founder, also known as my dad, does. It's our family ministry that he runs. So he develops uh, resources for parents. He travels around the country speaking um, at um, Iron Sharpens Iron men's events, homeschool conferences. He travels a lot internationally, talking with missionaries. So he's very much engaged in that, and that allows me to focus on the other three things. So this is the math. We have the blocks here. So this is our, our, we use these blocks to teach math. Here's some more. We've got still textbooks, DVDs, hardback, paper. So we're still using old fashioned textbooks, but we're starting to put some of that content on iPads. So we're making that transition to digital. Spelling is also very much textbook driven, um, and we use colored pencils to actually help with the writing. So it's a very interesting approach. The act of writing actually helps you remember things, which is why many of you are taking notes. Good job. And then stewardship um, is part of the Building Faith Families curriculum, and it's a Christian approach to consumer finance. And then Kindertown, we've just launched some power packs on that. We like to say when I talk to a parent, there's 796,000 apps in the iOS store that deal with learning, and you don't have time to figure out which ones work for your six-year-old. So we, we basically just take all of the data and we have an expert go through it, we sort it, and we filter it, and we give you the top 70 or so apps. A little bit about homeschooling, since uh, most people are unaware of what homeschooling is. This is the growth um, in the data of homeschooling. So from back here when I was actually born, back in 1982 until the present, here's the current um, top researchers' estimates on the actual population. The number that we rely on the most is actually this blue line. But we're currently talking about 2 million students are homeschooled in the United States. 
um, and that is up from uh, when I was starting to be homeschooled of a couple hundred thousand. So back in the old days when I was a young kid uh, in Georgia, homeschooling was actually illegal. And so I spent time hiding in the house and we were, we were told to hide from the police if they came around to the front door. And if we went out shopping, we had to memorize a speech that we told people when they said, why aren't you in school? And we said, well, I'm a homeschooled student and my mother is my teacher and she's right over there. And back in the early days, everyone looked at homeschoolers like, those guys are weird. And we've got some weird ones, let me tell you. But um, now it's, it's a mainstream phenomenon in America. So right now, homeschooling is just another educational option. And that also changes the mix of people who homeschool. So in the early days, it was very, people homeschool for much more religious reasons. Now it is just an alternative education lifestyle. So my kid is in lacrosse, um, and they are gonna be on a traveling lacrosse team, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna homeschool them during that time. So people are now switching, and the barrier of entry to another educational environment is probably the lowest it's ever been. And the curriculum resources are, there's a lot of them, including ours. So homeschooling is on the rise. It's slowing a little bit. It's not on a meteoric rise that's changing the world, but it is now right up there with some of your, your private school environments. Here's our main competitors. If you're in business, you always want to find out what are you doing, what's your niche, and then who are you competing against. These are some of them. You may have heard of Saxon Math, Singapore, teaching textbooks, um, all about spelling, Bob Jones spelling. Here's a little bit of our market share numbers. I figured I'd share a few more numbers with you since I doubt many of my competitors are in the room or that they'll watch this video online. Uh, but if they do, they probably have the same numbers. So we have about, in the K through five range, we have about 6% market share. Um, so of the homeschool market, we've got about 6%. And given that there's about 50 different math curriculums out there, uh, that puts us in the top three in the homeschool market. So we have a very strong brand presence in the homeschool market. And that tailors off at the upper level where there's even more uh, market competition. And a lot of people are now putting their kids in school for that. Let's check on time here. Rolling through. We've got, this is my five year strategic plan that I developed uh, with my team. And we're working through this one as we go. Uh, we're looking to two big things. So we had a, we had a core great product in the homeschool market, uh, K through 12 math. and so. The first thought is what other markets is the math product applicable in? Without a whole lot of revision to the product, can we sell this to another market? So we're looking at growth in new markets, learning centers, charters, um, schools, mainly focused on RTI tier three intervention programs. We're also looking at how can we grow in our current markets. Um, one of those markets is we do sell internationally, um, which is a really interesting one for us, homeschooling is actually on the rise. If we go back to that other slide, talking about the growth in the US, homeschooling in a lot of other countries is where we were back in the late 90s. So homeschooling is growing in places like Australia, uh, New Zealand, Singapore, South Africa, the UK, the Philippines. Um, so we actually are selling our program through distribution in those countries. So I've spoken to groups of homeschoolers in all those countries. Um, and it's, 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 not a, it's not an American phenomenon and it's, it's growing internationally. But doing business internationally and learning how different cultures operate or their, the way they do business, starting to deal with value added tax uh, when you're doing with the UK, way too much fun and that's why you hire accountants. Uh, we're also looking at what new products and services can we offer to our existing markets. So we're looking at spelling, we're looking at more math modules as a supplemental approach as opposed to a, a full curriculum approach. We're looking at more online instruction. We're looking at building our brand in the parent engagement, education reform, and digital worlds. And we're looking at quality and efficiency in our organization. So when you experience some, some large growth in staff um, and resources, you also then try to get QA processes. We did CRM. You all know what CRM is, right? Customer um, relationship management tools. So if you've got a good sales team, making sure they've got a good tool is really good for that. And so we were on a, a revenue goal. Um, this year we hit 
we're on track to hit about 7.5 million and we're targeting uh, 10 million by the 16, 17 school year. So that's our, our, our BHOG, we call it at our company meetings, so our big, hairy, audacious goal. Um, and then when I was growing up, it was in our basement um, and we would pack the boxes at night when my dad got home from painting houses. So it's fun to see a company go from literally in my basement to uh, now we've got a large warehouse and over 50 employees. And that's some of the growth, how it's going to roll out and hit, get us to that goal. And then I talked through a little bit of this, but we break up our growth strategy. The way we approach growth is we want to look at what's our core growth areas, what are our adjacent growth areas, and what are our transformational growth areas. And that also changes your resource allocation into those areas. So we try to put about 85% you know, into that core growth. If you've got something keep that's working, keep doing it. And then how can you move laterally into some adjacent areas? So we're looking at that core product, core market, increasing retention, updated packaging, and looking at some alternative distribution models. We think we can probably get another million dollars out of just the core product in that current market in the next two years. Adjacent, taking that math product into the schools. It's definitely a big growth area. We launched Spelling UC into the home ed market. That one took off. Um, and we're looking at our online classes and professional development or teacher training is a big, a big shift, especially as state budgets are shifting. A lot more is being focused on teacher training. So we're wanting to take advantage of that. And then transformational is really focusing maybe one to three percent of your resource allocation on investing in something that's a long-term investment that says, I'm going to put a little bit of money into this every year for the next five years in the hope that I'm going to get to where I think the market is going to go. So these are our sort of three things that we're really focusing on there. Kindertown, the acquisition, um, currently generates zero revenue and costs me money every year. Um, but I think it's, it's meeting a need that is only going to be more important in the next couple of years. So parents, um, especially given the changes in our education market, have a couple challenges. Uh, we've got state budgets that are cutting their education funding. And we've got a whole bunch of uh, standards and testing that are really trying to get kids up because what kids need to know today by the time they get to college is more than they needed to know before, especially in math. So one of the big things we're looking at is uh, platform as a service, or P-A-A-S, um, for parents to help them evaluate what their kids know and don't know, give them extra tools of how they can help their kids either catch up or get ahead and then assess whether what they're currently doing, whether it's in school or homeschooling, is working or not. So that's what I call our DL platform. So, but it also is one where you really want to say, it's a, one of those crazy ideas that may not work, which is why you put a little bit of investment in it and see what sticks. So now we're going to take a few minutes to talk a little bit about some of the lessons that I've learned along the way. Um, one of them is I don't wear a tie all the time. I was wearing one yesterday though. And some of the lessons I've learned, um, I'll start with some management lessons since I'm a, I was a young manager when I started managing people. So I graduated college, I, was, I had a communications degree and I was, in, I was interested in marketing. So I took over the whole marketing department um, for my dad and I was, because he had horrible marketing and I told him that and I was like, there's this thing dad called the internet. And there's this thing called blogs. And MySpace back then was a thing. So we had a MySpace page as a company. Um, and then Facebook had just launched. So when I was in college, we didn't have Facebook. This is in the old days. And so Facebook was around. So I said, and there's this other thing called email. We can do email marketing. So I started by just introducing all of those things, building organic lists, doing search engine optimization, AdWords, bunch of fun stuff. And which was great, you use your knowledge and your skills to produce actual work. And then I started doing this fun thing called management, where you get to actually tell other people what to do. And that is a whole different ballgame. So there's a couple things I've learned, um, which I would say are the biggest lessons that I've learned in management over the last probably 10 years that I've been, I've been doing that. It's actually about seven that I've been actually managing people. Pull up my notes here. So the one big thing I've learned is um, 
And this is where I might disagree with some of your textbooks. So what is the number one role of a manager? So the number one role of a manager, uh, in, in my approach, is the manager adds value to their subordinates. And if the manager is not adding value, in other words, if the manager is not there, do the subordinates produce the same amount of work? If they can produce the same amount of work without a manager, then you don't need the manager. So what is the manager doing every day, every week, every month, every year to add value and make the people work uh, smarter and more efficiently by giving them resources, helping them prioritize projects and things like that? Because one of the things that was a paradigm shift to me, which shifted the way I approached management, was I now hold the manager accountable for the results of the employee's work. So I'll say that one more time. I hold the manager accountable for the results of the employee's work. So commonly you'll look at, you know, the employee should be held accountable for their results. Um, so I hold employees accountable for showing up and giving me their best effort. And then it's their manager's job to use that person's best effort, knowledge, and skills to produce work. And I hold the manager accountable for the results. And it really shifts and puts a lot more focus on the manager to actually add value, because if they're not, it becomes very apparent. So that'd be a fun discussion topic when you come across that in your management books. And the other big thing is when there's disagreement about what the work needs to be done, we always write it down. So having very, very clear expectations and then writing those down um, is one of the hardest things you'll do, but, um, and I've had my managers push back and they hate it when I have them, they say, well, I told the person to do it and they didn't do it. Persons, it's their fault. And I say, well, what did you, then you ask that person, well, what did they tell you to do? Well, they told me to do this and I did it. You get giant communication breakdowns uh, when you have people doing stuff. Anytime you have people doing stuff. So then we write it down. So very, very, very clear role specifications and then very, very clear task assignments. So the only thing that an employee is being held accountable for is doing the work that we pay them to do and doing any extra work that the manager assigns for them to do. And those things need to be clarified and written down. And that, that task assigning process is you're writing down what's, what it is you're doing, what's the quality level, what does it look like when it's done, because that's usually where people disagree. I did it this much, and not, they expect it to be done this much, but they never said to do it this much. So we write down quality expectations, quantity expectations, how much resources am I giving you to do the work, and then what's the time that it's going to be due. So we really, really stress that. And that's what I've found every single time I've had a, um, an employee problem or a management issue, or even with my own people that I'm managing, we're just not on the same page. I usually find out that if I slow it down and I write it down, and then I make it very, very clear, then it's my, because it's my responsibility as the chief executive to make sure that my, to add value to my direct reports. And if they're not producing the results, whose fault is it? It's my fault. Um, and it really changes some of that dynamic. So that's probably my number one thing that I've learned in management is don't get mad at your people if they don't do the stuff that you thought they were supposed to do. You usually didn't tell them clearly enough. A um, Couple lessons I've learned from just being, um, I'm 33 years old. So when you're the, when you're, and I had some of my employees, I when you inherit employees too, so I started running the company, and I had employees that my dad had hired 15 years ago um, that were my Sunday school teachers. Um, so these are some of these, I had some employees that had known me since I was born, and I grew up playing with their kids, and that's a little awkward when you have to sit down and, and uh, give someone a performance improvement plan. So. One of the things I've learned, especially when you're dealing with managing older people who are older than you, who have a lot more life experience than you, and they're looking at you like, what the heck is this whippersnapper doing sitting down with a suit telling me what to do? He's just here because his daddy runs the company. So the number one thing I've learned is you need to treat, it sounds like a common sense thing, but you need to treat everybody alike. And the first step to treating everybody alike is, um, treating yourself like everybody else. So this is the thing I've learned, especially when I walk into a, a boardroom full of powerful people, I treat them like anybody else. 
Um, I don't bow and scrape. I've, I, I was talking to my wife and she was like, yeah, when you were in college and you met some famous person, like when you first meet your first famous person, you're like, oh man, I'm, I'm gonna meet that person. Um, and then you get to maybe go to lunch with them and you're all nervous um, and you meet that person. People like that who are rich and powerful or how are famous people, they hate it when people treat them like that. So if you just treat them like a regular person, like, hey, how's it going? You treat people with respect. And that way, whether they're a poor person who has no power, you treat that person the same way because you never know when that person is going to launch a startup and be the next Mark Zuckerberg. So it just makes it a whole lot easier to not judge someone and treat them differently based on their status. And uh, I've found that to be much uh, a fun story of this. I was actually down in DC uh, two weeks ago, and this is where we're going to drop a name, name drop. Um, and I had a friend who had gone to college with a guy and he invited him out to lunch with us. And there was, so it was myself, my friend, and this guy had another younger uh, friend who was currently um, going to college. And so the friend was Chris Matthews. So I got to eat lunch with Chris Matthews. And when my friend was like, do you mind if Chris comes along? And I was like, uh, no, because that would be cool. So Chris Matthews, for those of you who don't watch TV, is, is on Hardball with Chris Matthews. And I'm a big into politics. Um, so we're eating lunch with Chris Matthews, and Chris likes to pontificate. It's pretty much like being on hardball. And then when I thought he was being wrong and an idiot on something, I told him that ah, it's incorrect. And so we had a great argument, which is what I would do with anybody. Um, and then the other kid over there was about your, your guys' age, and he's, he's going, oh, this is, I'm just happy to be here. Because Chris is like, come on, what, what do you think about this? You know, we're talking about Swaziland, because uh, he was in the Peace Corps in Swaziland. So he's asking foreign policy advice on how do you fix Africa. And the kid goes, I'm just happy to be here. And at the end, he stood up and was like, can I get a picture with you, Mr. Matthews? So I took the people's picture. I was like, would I like a picture with Chris Matthews to put on Facebook? Absolutely. But am I going to act like that when I meet a famous person? No, I just treat them like I would want to be treated. I don't necessarily want someone to come take their picture with me unless I know them. So that's one of the number one things I've learned is when you meet somebody, you just treat them the way you would want to be treated, with respect. And uh, the biggest thing is you have to sort of respect yourself in order to do that. And that's something I've learned. It takes a while and, and some practice, but you got to get to know yourself and be comfortable with who you are just the way you are and have an honest assessment of here's what I am, here's what I'm capable of, and then that's what it is. Uh, the other biggest thing I learned from college or since college is learn from other disciplines. So cross-train your mind. So cross-training is one of those things which you do in sports. I do a lot of triathlons, so I do a lot of running, biking, and swimming. And so occasionally I cross-train, so I'll do a little taekwondo for a while or other things that use lateral movement because, and I'll learn things from those sports and apply them to the sport that I'm trying to be excel in. And the same goes for business. So I like to read books that are outside of, I read a lot of business books, a lot of business books, but occasionally I like to read other books that are not even close to business books. I read like a philosophy book or a biography, or I'll read, uh, my wife is a musician, so I'll, I'll learn from her about music. I was just at a presentation with a guy on, on giving effective presentations, and I realized that all of his great advice he was giving, I learned when I was a, in theater in college, and I realized, didn't realize, oh wait, I can take projecting my voice from theater and apply it to standing behind a podium. So cross-discipline training is one of those really cool things. Reading history books, um, reading economics books. If you're a business major, just don't read business books. Read other books. Then the other big thing that I learned um, is called embracing, I call it embracing awkward. So. Has anyone here ever felt awkward in a situation? Everyone should raise their hand. If not, great. Um, I feel awkward all the time. But I learned early on that everyone else was also feeling awkward. So if you've ever been to, I was at, a, was at an event yesterday. Um, I was doing a political meeting. And then the two guys I was in the meeting with invited me, hey, you want to stop by this fundraiser with us? We'll get you in. And I was like, great. So I went to a fundraiser in Philadelphia for a politician, and I knew like the two people that I came with. So I'm in this fancy room full of a whole bunch of high-powered people in Philly, and I know political people in Lancaster, but I don't know political people in Philly. So 
how do you walk up to, how do you work a room? If you've taken networking classes or you talk about networking, how do you work a room? The biggest thing um, is you embrace the awkwardness of working a room. Walking up to a stranger and saying, hey, I'm Ethan. What's your name? Josh. Josh, great to meet you, Josh. That was just as awkward for him as it was for me. <laughs> and so this is one of the things I learned to do is learn that other people are just as awkward deep down. They may be hiding it behind some facade. They are either like well-dressed or they're, they're laughing or they're telling jokes. But just embrace the fact that deep down they're nervous and they'd like to meet somebody too. So here's a practical tip on how to work a room. So we've got a few minutes. So here's how to work a room in a couple easy steps. So the first thing you do, if you walk into a room that's this big, all these people are in it, we're all standing around high tops, and you don't know anybody here. There's four corners to the room. You start at a corner, and you find the person who is the wallflower. Like, find the, most, the person who looks the most nervous to be in that room. You want to find someone who's more nervous than you are. And you walk up to that person, and you're like, hey, I'm Ethan. What are you doing here? And you know what they're doing there. They're same for the same fundraiser that you're at. So you meet that one person, and that person is just thrilled that someone's talking to them because so they don't have to be on their phone in the corner. Yeah, I'm just checking email. That's fine. And then you hang out for a little bit. Then you go to the bar or wherever it is where the drinks are, and you stand in line. And while you're in line, you can always meet the person behind you, and you say, man, this is a long line. Then you meet that person. Then you go to the other corner of the room. You find the next wallflower. And then, by that point, you've got three points of contact. Then you go back to your original point and you start inviting the other ones in. And you say, hey, Josh, have you met Sarah? You both, are, at this, you both are, are interested in the same thing that we're all interested in by being here. You guys should talk. And they're really happy that they made a contact. So the biggest way to, uh, to get over being a wallflower is to realize that everyone else is and introduce other people that you just met 30 seconds ago. And Mandy, you seem like you're a connected, really smart person. <laughs> so that is how to work a room in a couple simple steps. Embrace the fact that it's awkward. And that works in plenty of other areas. Um, sometimes you just have to practice being awkward. And once you practice it long enough, you just sort of roll with the flow. So embrace that awkwardness, whether it's having a one-on-one -on -one staff meeting with a subordinate where you're talking about the fact that you may have to fire them if they don't step up their job improvement uh, performance or in a hiring situation. If you're nervous when you're going into your first interview, do mock interviews or interview at a couple places where you know you're not gonna, you don't want the job even if you get it. So over apply a couple places just to get interview practice because it is awkward. Interviews are designed to be awkward. And when I run interviews, I design them to be more awkward because I want to see how people react when it's really uncomfortable. So um, the more practice you have being awkward, the better it is. So put yourself in situations, even on college, you've got tons of opportunities as a college student to be awkward. Um, walk into a class that you're not in and just sit there until someone the teacher asks you why you're there and you have to get up and look stupid in front of everybody and walk out. Just, just do it for fun. Um, and then you can say, oh, it's a joke, and maybe you can film it, put it on YouTube and be like, I was pranking people. You ever watch those videos on YouTube where the person is just awkwardly pranking people? Like they walk up, pour water on someone's head, and then run away? Imagine doing that with no camera. That's just weird. Um, but you put a camera on it, all of a sudden it's funny. And then the number one thing um, that I would also say is be very clear and firm and direct about, and about what you want. You need to know what you want, and more importantly, you need to know what you're willing to do to get it. And even more important than knowing what you're willing to do to get something, you have to know what you're willing not to do. Um, because if you're trying to get somebody, get something or somebody, or, or get a sale, you have to know what's my boundary of how far am I willing to go to get this sale. If you're negotiating a, a, a discounted price, what's the point at which you start losing money? So you have to know what that is before you go into it. You can't go into your negotiation and walk out, well, I got a 38% discount. You go back to your controller and he says, well, 38% loses us money every time we make a sale. But that also works with 
just getting a job or having, because anyone who's your boss or is in charge of you is going to try to get as much out of you as possible. They're going to try to work you hard and get as much value out of you as possible. So you have to be willing to know what am I willing to do to be successful at this job and what am I willing not to do. Sometimes that I'm willing to work every day of the week, 10 hours a day, but you know, my family, we always get together for Thanksgiving and we need to do that. That's a thing and they ask you to work on Thanksgiving, what do you do? If you have to make those hard decisions when you're being pressured at the moment when someone's pressuring you, it's not gonna go well. I take it from personal experience. Um, but if you've made your mind up ahead of time about what you're willing to do and not to do, and it helps if you're unsure, write those things down, then you know. Then when you walk into the, the thing, the person says, no, I want you to do this. You say, no, I don't do those things. I already, I already, I already and you have a great excuse. It's, you know, I've made a decision. I don't do those things. I'm planning on being with, at home on, on Thanksgiving with my family because that's one of my core values and I'm not gonna break that one. But hey, I work seven days a week the rest of the week. So that's the other number one thing that I would say is really be clear about what you're willing to do and not do. Um, and don't let, that helps it so people don't take advantage of you. Because people will try to take advantage of you, even your family members. Take it from someone who's involved in a family business, your family will try to take advantage of you. It's human nature. We want to get stuff and other people help us get stuff. And the more clear you are, the better the other person likes you. Because if you ask somebody, hey, uh, you want to go to breakfast tomorrow? And they're like, yeah, yeah, I'd love to go to breakfast. And you know, there's always that person that you always invite to go do something, and they always have an excuse like the day before. Like, oh, no, I, was going, I, I need to go to this other thing, man. I can't make it. Or would you rather the person said, no, I'm, I'm busy that week, and, or I'm, I don't want to go to breakfast. We appreciate it when other people are honest and straight with us when it comes to things. Um, so we can return that favor by being very upfront um, and honest with them. Really helps in negotiations. So with that, those are my sort of lessons learned. Uh, I always like to say advice is free. The free advice costs you money. So if you want really good advice, you can pay me. And with that, we can jump to some questions and answers. Yes, sir. What do you do to make your interviews extra awkward? What do I do to make my interviews extra awkward? Um, I like to do what's called, well, I always take in, our, our, man, our interview process is we have a hiring manager, and then we have the manager once removed from the subordinate. So the manager's manager is always in the room for the final interview. So we always have at least two people in the room, and I play good cop, bad cop. Um, so if one person's going down a track, so usually some person's sort of really pushing an issue and the other person's being nice. So sometimes we good cop, bad cop. Um, the other thing that I like to do is I like to, I like to find out how far someone can move. So I'll ask them questions like, and I'll get off topic because I really don't care what the answer is. I care how they, how, I, wanna, I wanna fluster the person and get them thinking and I want to, I want to ver uh, visually see how they think and, and problem solve. So I'll say, you know, if the person likes football, I'll say, well, you like the Eagles? And they might be hardcore Eagles. Yeah, I love the Eagles. So I was like, all right. And I, I could care less about football. All I know is that person is passionate about this thing. So I pick one thing that they're passionate about and then I say, all right, uh, who's the coach of the Eagles right now? Any Eagles fans? Who's the coach of the Eagles? What's he doing this, that's working really well for the Eagles? Develop a good offense. What could he do that can make it better? Be a better coach. Well, how would you be a better coach? So this is the type of thing. I find that thing. And no one comes into an interview prepared to answer, answer how can the offensive coach do better for the Eagles. No one prepped for that. So I start pressing him. And when they give me vague answers like he could be a better coach, which is your default, like no one <laughs> I wasn't prepped for that. So I keep pushing. And then I could say, or if they say they're, they're doing horribly, well, how could they make it better? Because that's what I'm looking for in an employee is how can they use their problem solving skills to improve something? It's that continual improvement mindset. So I get to see how they operate. And then I find something that they know nothing about. Because usually an Eagles fan has an opinion about how the Eagles coach can do better. Should they have traded Tim Tebow or not? Um, this is his cool, I, he's got some offensive thing that he does. 
I, I know nothing about football. But I do know that the Rugby World Cup starts today and go Wales. <laughs> so I pick something else and I find someone who knows nothing about, say, space exploration. And I'll just lob this softball question out of nowhere of, you know, do you think we should have cut Nassau's budget? Should that something be something the private sector does, space exploration, or should that be something that the public sector does? Is it in our national security's best interest to, to go to Mars? What about going to Mars? Is going to Mars good for our, for our economy? So, and I want to see how someone problem solves like a super complex problem that there's no way they're going to get the answer right. Like they are going to fail at this question because they don't know the answer, but I want to see them try to get the answer and then fail. Because observing how someone fails tells me a lot about that person. So those are two ways that I make uh, interviews difficult. So usually I have the hiring manager ask all the questions about, do you have the knowledge, the skills to do the job? You know, can you type this fast in, in Microsoft Word? Uh, when have you used CRM in the past? Um, and then I always rabbit trail. I pick something that jumps out and I rabbit trail and I throw a couple curveballs in. And then I ask one question at the end of every interview, um, which you would be surprised how many people fall for this one. I start with, it's a two-parter. I say, well, is there anything that um, we should have asked you that you didn't ask, that we didn't ask? Like, you prep for some of these questions in this interview. Is there any softball that, like, you were just waiting, we were just going to lob it to you, you're going to hit that one out of the park? What's the perfect question that we just forgot to ask you? Sometimes they'll tell you, and, and then you ask it, and then they give you the great response. They feel good, and then I say, is there any question that right now you're breathing a sigh of relief that you were hoping that I wouldn't ask and we didn't ask you. And they'll tell you. About five out of 10 times the person will actually tell you, oh man, I thought you were gonna ask about the fact that I really suck at doing this. And then I go, oh, well what about the fact that you really suck at doing that? Tell me about it. And then they go, oh, you were gonna. <laughs> but by the end of the interview, you're all in interview mode. And you, so that's one question I also ask that just throws people. Um, and sometimes I've actually, there was one case where the person actually gave one of those, here's a great reason why you shouldn't hire me answers at the very end. And she was the candidate we were going to hire. And then that last question, I've had a couple last questions like that, where they then revealed something and we're like, yeah, nope, we're not hiring that person. Other times they've, they've revealed something. It's like, oh, well, I appreciate the honesty. And we ended up hiring them. So it's not a deal breaker. It's just how do you respond to stress? Great question. Any other questions? Any questions? Come on, you're, you're a bunch of college students. I know that deep down, none of you want to ask a question. There we go. So uh, whenever you took over the company, did you have anything to do with the design of the logo? Um, so three of the logos I had designed and put on. Um, the, well, the Matthew C. logo was there when I got there. Uh, even though I had design input, it was just design input around the dinner table. Um, so the spelling you see logo was an interesting one. Um, that one required some company polling. But the one I really like is the Demi Learning logo. So which, which one of the logos jumped out to you? The, the Demi Learning one. Um, Why did it jump there, out? Why is the E tilted? Why is the E tilted? So uh, a couple reasons why the E is tilted. So, I geek out a little bit on the marketing side. So here's that logo broken down. So first of all, I actually didn't want my last name to be the publishing name. But my marketing firm convinced me that that was a great idea and it, and it helped build continuity, especially with a family business. So I wanted the E to be tilted and I put a little box around it and I love the color orange. So the, it, there's a box around it because that looks like an icon on a phone. And if you, so it's apps. So people are already thinking, oh, it looks like an app. And the E is tilted to call attention to the E uh, for two reasons. One, because it's hard to pronounce my last name. Usually if someone calls and says, is Ethan Dem there or Demi? Uh, then I know it's a telemarketer and I hang up. Mm -hmm. uh, even when I was introduced, Dimitri goes, how do you pronounce your last name? Because it, it doesn't make, like you can't look at it and go, oh, that's Demi. So Dem E. It helps you pronounce the name. And the other one is it's Dem E-Learning or E-Learning. So it shows the future state of our company is hidden in the logo. We're an E-Learning company. That's the, that's the reasoning. 
And there's also a, a slight sunrise you can see on the bigger logo, but there's a slight sunrise there, which is sort of a new day, next generation. Yes? Funny that, like, the math you see was like the letter U, and mm -hmm. the spelling one was actually U. Like, why was that intentional? Uh, so, yes, Matthew C. logo versus spelling U. C. logo. Yes, that was um, intentional. So, my dad is a math teacher, and if you've ever met a math teacher, they are full of puns. There's something about math teachers that they make really horrible groaner jokes. Like, how much did the pirate pay to get his ears pierced? A buccaneer. It's one of my dad's favorite jokes. <laughs> so math you see is a pun on, hey, it's math that you see. And we use plastic blocks to help you see math. So when we launched Spelling UC, there was a giant debate within our company of, should we continue with the UC name, or we should go with a completely separate brand? Um, I was advocating the completely different brand. We had two different logos developed, and we actually split tested them with our market. And we ended up going with the spelling you see because the brand recognition was just very strong there. So the other big one was a spelling company shouldn't misspell their name. So our whole launch concept was Matthew C is getting a sister. And we're a, so we use family business. So we use all of the sort of the familiar terms. So Matthew C is getting a sister and she knows how to spell. So she's correcting the logo errors of the past and, and writing out spelling you see. Logos are really fun. Everyone, anyone look at the Amazon logo? And you see that the arrow underneath shows that they sell everything from A to Z? Yep, that's what the arrow is pointing, A to Z. So Amazon sells everything from A to Z. Any other questions? Yes, again. Has anyone ever accused you of getting the job just because your dad runs a company? And how have you handled it? Um, has anyone accused me of getting a job because my dad runs a company? Absolutely. You will definitely get that. Um, I used to actually hang a poster over my desk. Um, there's a website called despair.com that has demotivational posters on it. And I had the de demotivational poster. I had a picture of a giant lion and a, and a lion's cub, and it said, nepotism. We promote family values around here just as much as we promote family members. <laughs> so I just owned it. I mean, you're always going to get that, that concept. The other difference, though, is if you work, um, I like to say, I've doubled the company's size and I've doubled our employees, um, and my other two brothers work for me. <laughs> so, yes, I definitely, I would say, if my last name wasn't Demi, I wouldn't be in charge of the company, um, but do I have the capability of running a company? I would say the track record speaks for itself. So now that I have the, the record, I could go out and run another company. But could a 33-year-old just get hired as the CEO with no CEO experience? Also, probably not. So right place, right time, right last name definitely helps. So I own it. Um, but I also say the spelling you see was my idea. That, so that was the first one that said, hey, we're doing something completely different with a whole different author um, that had no legacy impact. That wasn't my dad hadn't started that one. So when that one launched and was successful, um, and we were cash flow positive uh, in three months after launch when we were projecting two years. I was happy. So yes, you'll get, uh, I'm also tall. I have darker hair. I have hair. Um, and I'm white. And I'm a male. So all of those things definitely impact. Um, unfortunately, if you look at Fortune 500 companies and you, and you say, you know, just do a looks analysis of, of the people who are on there. It looks like a country club. Um, but if you have blonde hair, like light blonde hair, your odds, and you're male, your odds of actually getting in the C-suite at that level are lower than even if you're a female getting in the C-suite. Hopefully, our next generation and you guys can help reverse that trend and we can start to put a much more diverse face on the people leading our, co our companies. Any other questions? We've got time for just one or two more. Uh, in the back there. How many people that you hired that were homeschooled? Is that something How many people have I hired that were homeschooled? In the homeschool sales and customer service side, um, we like to hire from the homeschool pool. So we have 
My senior leadership, I have two employees that were homeschooled, uh, two that were not, uh, one public, one private. Um, uh, probably throughout the company, we probably have maybe 20% that are homeschool students. Uh, it definitely reduces the training curve. If you're selling into the homeschool market and you go to your first homeschool conferences, so these are like trade shows that we go to about 60 of these around the country every year. Um, so we're flying, we're setting up, we're doing point of sale, swiping credit cards. There's 20,000 people that'll come through the doors of the Duke Energy Center in downtown Cincinnati every year. And it's the biggest homeschool conference. And we'll have a team of 10 people there selling. Um, it's crazy. And then you'll be in the basement of some church in, in Louisiana and 200 people show up and you've got two people and you're just sleeping half the time. So it's a very diverse group of people. And if you've lived that world, your training curve is much um, faster than everyone else's. But it's not a requirement, but it definitely helps. There's another question. Yes? Uh, where do you advertise your products? Advertising. Um, so advertising in the homeschool market, there's a couple magazines and websites. Um, we do a lot where we're trying to work on um, sort of that word of mouth um, campaign. So we do a lot now. And we're even... Every year we've cut from our print advertising budget and we throw the money into uh, digital. So Facebook is huge for us. Um, we have probably, at any given time, we have like four or five people on Facebook um, through Hootsuite that are answering people's questions. So people, uh, or customer service questions we get on Facebook, Twitter. We're monitoring all the social channels and we're responding. Usually within an hour of someone asking a question, we're, we're responding to it. Uh, we get bloggers to review our product, uh, Google AdWords, working on our net promoter score to try to get those referrals. Um, and then we're also out at those conferences. So a lot of it's too is then we're giving away information, getting a lead, and then calling up the lead. So now the school market is very different. Uh, we're definitely doing a, a very light advertising approach in the school market. We're working off of essentially cold calling uh, the targeted areas and then setting up appointments, and then the sales. So it's, you got a, one person who's just cold calling all day and setting up appointments, and that job sucks. Uh, but someone's got to do it, and then you've got the salesperson who then does the appointments, demos the product. It's a three to six month sales cycle. So schools are a whole different animal. But the internet is the answer. Once we figure out how to do Pinterest better, uh, we'll be jumping onto that. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Uh, well, it depends on the competition. If the competitor is going to the same shows that we're going to, and half of some of the shows get slow, you get to know them. So you know your competitors pretty well. That are the smaller ones that are sort of our size in the same market. The big ones like Pearson, like in the school market, you know, those, you got Giant, Houghton Mifflin, Harcourt, Pearson. Saxon actually was purchased by Houghton Mifflin. Um, so you got some of the bigger companies that not as much. And then the smaller ones, you do. Um, you're frenemies, really. I mean, you're, you're competing, but you're not really competing. Sometimes you'll even share some sales numbers, like what you do. Are you up or down this, this show? We're both down 10%. Um, and then, but I always take an approach, and this is sort of my personal approach. Some people are much more standoffish with competitors. I would rather become friends with the people who are in the same market, because I can learn a lot from them. Um, and, I, and to learn a lot from somebody, you have to share a lot. So I always say the word I use, uh, the phrase I use when I'm talking with a competitor, I had one in my office the other day who flew out, CEO of a much larger company that has a, one of the competing math programs, flew out just to meet with me in my office. So we had a whole meeting and we've talked on the phone. She's looking to, and she's in the acquisitions mode, so she was looking to acquire me and I didn't want to be acquired, but we got to share some data. So I always say ideas are free, execution costs you money. So. There's a bunch of free ideas out there in the world. A lot of people think, oh, I got to keep my ideas safe. Ideas of how to, a great business ideas are a dime a dozen. There's a million fantastic, great ideas. People like to think that theirs is really special. I've got a great idea for a reading program that's going to do all these great things. Okay, well, how are you going to do it? How are you going to execute on that idea? So I've got a million ideas that I don't have time to do or the resources to do. So I'm happy to share all my ideas and my plans 
with my competitors because I don't think they're going to execute and because they've got a whole strategic plan and they have a whole different niche than I do, a different market focus. And it's, so that approach has made it so I also have more information than other people do. And I'm currently in talks, we're passing on it, but one of my competitors wanted me to buy them. <laughs> so you sign an NDA, non-disclosure agreement, and I have all of his sales data for the last 20 years. How valuable is that to me? Just going through the process of the due diligence on an acquisition and then passing on it, I come away with a ton of, of, of market data that I didn't have before. I didn't realize that this guy was not making as much money as I thought he was making. Um, and part of the reason I passed was he's on a downward slope and I'm on an upward slope. It's cheaper and easier for me just to take market share. So. But the, uh, the most interesting thing and the thing that's going to probably impact everyone in this room the most is demographics. So by 2030, every single one of the baby boomers will be above the age of 65 and on the retirement road. Which means that there is a 20% leadership gap in every major business or business, small business, large business, but mainly small businesses. There's this giant leadership gap. There's a vacuum that's going to happen. So in other words, just the sheer numbers of people who are in upper management and running companies who are baby boomers versus the numbers of Gen X and millennials that there are to replace them, the numbers do not work. So there is 20% just, there aren't enough bodies to fill those roles. So you're, you're perfectly staged to leverage some career moves, strategic career moves over the next 15 years to probably become the leaders for the next 30 years. I look at that based on where I'm situated and I go, that also means there's going to be a lot of consolidation in the marketplace and there's going to be a lot of acquisition um, that are, is going to happen. So either companies are going to go out and I can take market share or the companies are going to be sold because there's very few, most of those small businesses are family businesses with no succession planning. Um, so, and, and typically based on age, of the age of my dad and myself, most businesses wouldn't have done their full succession plan at the time that we did it. It was just what worked well for us. Most people would have probably waited another five, 10 years. So now I have more experience in the market. So when other people are doing their succession plans or haven't done them, I have a mature business that I know how to operate and I'm looking at acquiring companies in the next 10 years because they're just gonna start falling off. Um, so it's a great opportunity to be in business as a young person right now. So for the next 15 years, this is where you're gonna make your hay. After that point, all the positions will be filled and you either got one or you didn't. <laughs> but it's a great time to be in business. It's also a great time to be in education because at the same 2030 peak, you have the highest number of students in K through 12. So there's a giant wave of that next generation coming through and they're all gonna be in K through 12 at the same point. And it's gonna create a giant budget crunch for every single state dealing with retirees and pension plans and K through 12 education funding because there's not nearly enough money to go around and both are gonna get cut. And guess who votes? Not kids. So education funding is gonna get screwed, which means I can sell the people for cheaper. So there's always an opportunity. All right, one final question. Anybody? Yes, final question. Do you ever feel like I had another plan? So I never felt like I had to go in my family business. Um, I actually wrote the plan. Uh, so at each stage when I sort of moved up the ladder, graduated college, wrote my dad a business plan of here's what your strengths and weaknesses are, here's what mine are, um, I'm good at marketing, I'm gonna do this, we'll do it for a couple years. If I'm good at it um, and you like what I'm doing, I'll learn from you the other pieces and I'll slowly transition because I started with one key question. Do you want this to be a family business, yes or no? If no, it's fine, I'll do something else. But if yes, I'll take the opportunity. But I didn't even think of that when I went to college. So I went to college to be a, a, a PE instructor, physical education, because I, I wasn't even planning on going to college. And then I decided to at the spur of the moment. And then I switched to a film major, um, and then I, but they hadn't created the film major yet, so I was a communications major to prep me for the film major. 
And then I got and I found I liked communication much more than film. After editing film for hours and hours, I realized I'd rather be out talking to people and selling stuff. So I found I love communication much better. So I've switched my career path multiple times, but each time it was to something. So anyone who's in that undecided, I, I've got a couple younger, um, my wife's younger siblings, all live, a couple of them live with us. And so I'm always saying, pick something and start moving towards it. And if you find you don't like it, pick something else. It's perfectly fine to switch. Um, and then, especially younger people today, by the time you guys reach retirement, you'll have had, the, the research says, 35 different careers um, and a ton of different jobs. So I expect I'll probably do something else at some point. Or I'll keep running the business. But the business is either going to grow at the speed that I want it to grow or it's not. Um, and then I've got, always have other options. There's always other things. I do a lot of politics in my free time. So I'm an elected township supervisor. Um, I'm on a, a statewide political action committee board with the Pennsylvania Business Council. Um, I'm the former county chairman of Lancaster. So I've been doing politics. Next year will be my 20th year doing politics. So at some point, I may run for office. All right, well, thank you very much. You've been a great audience. Thanks for letting me come and speak to you.